The Forbidden and Limited list is one of the most talked about and highly debated topics in the entire Yu-Gi-Oh! community. We react to it, make predictions, anticipate it, and often we content creators schedule videos around it. Considering it's always been such a fascinating topic, I've decided to start a short series on the history of the list itself. A fairly simple concept in which I look at the list in totality and break down banned and limited cards year by year to give a quick history lesson to newer players. In this video, I'll explain why certain cards were added, give context to some of Konami's strange decisions, and even offer my opinion and go into detail on how I and the community felt about certain cards moving. Welcome to History of the Yu-Gi-Oh! Ban List. In this entry, I'll be covering banned monster cards. 2004. In August, Chaos Emperor Dragon, Envoy of the Inn, Sangain, Witch of the Black Forest, and Yadagurusu were all banned. 2004 gave birth to the official term Forbidden and Limited List, or Ban List as we usually call it. Prior to this, in 2002 and 2003, we had no banned cards and it was just the Limited or Restricted List. There's a strong argument to be made that the entire concept of banning a card in Yu-Gi-Oh! was because of Chaos Emperor Dragon and Yadagurusu. How Emperor Dragon was even created is just still beyond me, as it basically erased the entire duel, and I have no idea who thought that that would be a good idea. It was ridiculously easy to summon, had amazing stats, and did burn damage. It also made the infamous Yada Lock much more consistent and just easier to pull off. But uh, Emperor Dragon would have gotten banned regardless of Yada Gurusu. That was just kind of icing on the cake. Yada was essentially the kiss of death back in DM. If it ever did battle damage, your chances of winning went up exponentially. Yada was one of many tiny attack monsters that were absolute powerhouses during DM. The draw phase is the only guaranteed way of getting new resources every single turn, take away that from your opponents, and you'll eventually starve them out of a duel. Which in Sangan were sort of collateral damage of the Yada Lock as Konami wanted anything related to that play gone and out of the game, which was probably ban worthy. Sangan, I would say not, which searched most of Sangan's best targets, but in addition also searched juggernauts like Genzo, Breaker the Magical Warrior, Tribe Infecting Virus, etc. etc. Sangan was very strong, but not ban worthy at this point. In fact, Konami would bring Sangan back just two banless later. 2005. In April, Fiberjar, Magical Scientist, and Macure the Destructor were banned. Later in October, Blackluster Soldier, Envoy the Beginning, Sinister Serpent, and Tribe Infecting Virus were banned. Okay, so Fiber Jar is easy to explain. It was another one of those what the hell were they thinking cards. Just like TCG shouldn't have cards that erase the entire game, a la Chaos Emperor Dragon, they also shouldn't have reset buttons. As someone who played Fiber Jar and Burn decks back in those days, I loved the card, but I was admittedly a troll back then. It was unhealthy for the game, and it was one of those things that just everybody knew. Scientists facilitated a ridiculously consistent FTK using Catapult Turtle, but even if you weren't playing that deck, it was still just a staple card. A thousand life points was nothing to pay for getting a huge fusion monster, especially when some of those fusion monsters had built-in negation. Makiora was interesting, as it had a really inconsistent OTK with Call of the Haunted and Dark Scorpion Chick the Yellow, but its bark was a lot worse than its bite, and it wasn't very consistent. On the other hand, the Exchange of Spirits FTK that required Makiora was consistent as hell, and that deck would have been a menace. Konami prematurely banned Makiora so that it never existed in competitive play for the TCG. BLS and Sinister Serpent were both powerhouses of GOAT format that got the axe immediately as that ended. BLS was probably the sackiest card in the game, just like its brother Chaos Emperor, it was too easy to summon, had amazing stats, could end games, was a plus one on summon, honestly the card just had no downside. Sinister Serpent was a resource powerhouse as it made many of the hefty discard costs completely free and was slow but infinite fodder. Konami doesn't like infinite in Yu-Gi-Oh. Tri-Virus is the only monster of this bunch that I actually think didn't need to be banned. I'm not saying Sinister Serpent made this card what it was, but I believe that it would have been noticeably worse without it. Moving forward, you would have had to pitch real cards in a slow grindy format where it probably wouldn't have lived more than a turn or two. I think Duelist would have struggled to find solid discard fodder. 2006. In April, Cyberjar was banned. In September, Chaos Lord Sword Thousand Eyes Restrict and Tsukuyumi. And then finally in December, we had the Cyberstyle Emergency ban. Flip effects were still very prevalent at the beginning of GX, and I'd argue that Cyberjar was just too damn disruptive to basically the entire game state. 
It Dark Hole of the Field could summon a bunch of monsters for both players and added cards to both duelists' hands. It wasn't just that Cyber Jar's effect felt completely out of place in the game in general, I don't think people enjoyed the randomness of it. Chaos Sorcerer was banned because it had essentially become the new BLS, easy to summon, great stats, was always a plus one on summon, fueled return, yada yada yada. It was a monster with absolutely no downsides and it was dominating the meta, so aka the card was just too strong. Thousand Eyes Restrict and Tsukuyumi were both layovers from GOAT formats. I'm pretty surprised that Thousand Eyes made it out of that format alive. I mean, it was a completely meta warping card that made the game unbelievably slow and boring. Essentially, it was like Mystic Mind before Mystic Mind was Mystic Mind. Uh, Tsukuyumi is an instance where I don't agree with its banning, but I understand it. It was the perfect partner in crime with Thousand Eyes Restrict. It had insane synergy with flip effects, which I just mentioned were still very good at this time and it could single-handedly take down a monarch. Last but certainly not least was Cyberstein. This guy was like magical scientist reincarnated. Cyberstein summoned powerful fusion monsters at the cost of life points. Admittedly, it was far riskier as you could usually only use it once per duel, but most of the time that was enough. Just like scientists, Stein had a dedicated deck that's looked to end the duel in a single turn, but you could also splash it in everything. We called that the random Stein back then. If your opponent ever left themselves open, Stein could end the duel in an instant. This card was just too volatile for the game. 2007, in March, Break of the Magical Warrior, Magician of Faith, and Victory Dragon were all banned. We're now in the heart of GX and things are about to start getting weird. Prior to Stratos, I believed that Breaker was easily the best normal summon in the game. The card had no drawbacks whatsoever and had been a staple in every deck for three straight years. Either it was a huge 1900 beater, a plus one that outed a spell and trap for free, or it forced your opponent to trade a powerful defensive card like Torrential Tribute, lest they just lose it for nothing. Breaker was definitely ban worthy, I don't even think that's a question here. Magician of Faith also probably deserved the ban when the apprentice engine caught on in 2006 it meant that it could be summoned straight from the deck and this made the card a lot faster and more reliable not to mention the spell pool in those days was just pretty insane because like there were so many powerful spell cards that had not been banned yet victory dragon was actually a terrible card that wouldn't have been competitive in those days it wasn't banned for being too good or anything close to that but it was actually banned because of disputes when it came to sportsmanship before your opponent attacked with victory dragon and the TCG at least, you could simply forfeit the duel and your opponent would never be able to successfully resolve the card. So Konami kind of figured that having a win condition in the game that you could never successfully pull off because of a loophole just didn't really make any sense. 2008, in March, Break of the Magical Warrior and Magician of Faith were both rebanned. Then in September, Dark Magician of Chaos and Destiny Hero Disc Commander were banned. I told you things were gonna get weird, and during GX more than any other era of Yu-Gi-Oh, Konami did a lot of flip-flopping when it came to the FNL list. As I said previously, Breaker and Magician of Faith both earned and deserved their bannings in 2007, however, the engine that had catapulted Magician of Faith to God status had kinda worked itself out of the metagame by March, so ironically, the ban didn't make a lot of sense the second time around. Breaker was still ban worthy, like I don't really need to add anything else to that for the same reasons in 2008 as they were in 2007. Demok and Disc Commander were both banned prior to Teledad formats and I think they both overstayed their welcome. Demok was one of the driving forces behind the mighty Dark Arm Dragon Return, Diamond Dude Turbo, and a ton of FTK or FTK like decks post Phantom Darkness. When Konami gave us the Phantom Darkness emergency ban list, that was probably the right time to axe it. Demok had essentially become a much better version of Magician of Faith and was used to loop Dimension Fusion, which was the most powerful card in the game at the time. Disc Commander had been incredible since the moment it was released. Drawing two cards has and will always be a huge deal in this game, and people were willing to spend their limited revival cards, like Monster Reborn and Call of the Haunted, almost exclusively on this guy to get that draw to effect. The fact that it was highly searchable and a crush card target just made it all the better. 2009, in September, Dark Strike Fighter was banned. Yes, you heard me right. This was the only monster banned in the entire 2009 calendar year. One thing you're going to notice about 5Ds is that the amount of monster cards banned went down tremendously. Just as a side note, I guess that's probably a good thing. 
Full disclosure, the amount of reverence I have for this card is 100% unparalleled in this game, so yes, I'm kind of biased. DSF is basically the king of synchro monsters, and it completely redefined what an OTK was in this game. I've got a fully dedicated video planned for this card, so I won't give everything away here. Just know that it's one of the most powerful cards ever printed, and every deck that ran tuners during that format played the card. 2010, in September, Rescue Cat and Substitute were banned. Rescue Cat had already anchored the best deck in the game with Synchro Cats, and in 2010, it did that again with X Sabers. Konami was not about to let that continue. Obviously, only Stratos gets to do that. Cat, like another card we'll discuss later on this list, is what I like to call a ticking time bomb card. It's only a matter of time before said card becomes broken. Cat wasn't just a one card synchro that went into some of the best, like Bryonic, Goyo Guardian, and Xaber Hunley, but the monsters it summoned had no restrictions at all, and Cat required no prior setup to pull off. Substitute was mainly banned for facilitating the devious Frog FTK, which won Worlds that year. I say mainly because Substitute would have still been broken even if Konami banned Mass Driver like many fans suggested, and like they eventually did. Substitute allowed you to dump your entire 20 card Frog engine in the graveyard turn 0, and even without the FTK, it would have still allowed for some incredibly powerful synchro spam plays with minimal effort or risk. 2011, in March, Goyo Guardian, then later in September, Fishboard Blaster and Mind Master were banned. I'll start with Mind Master as it's almost identical to Substitute, centerpiece of an FTK, and uh, could allow insane synchro spamming even without the FTK. When it comes to Fishboard Blaster, as I said in my Fish OTK video, that card had near limitless potential in Fish OTK. It was essential in all the decks OTKs, and the fact that it was often summoned half a dozen times in a single turn is really what I believe got at the axe. The discard cost was actually there specifically so that you wouldn't be able to do this, but Formula Synchron completely mitigated the cost. The Goyo Guardian ban, on the other hand, was utterly ridiculous in my opinion. If Konami had done this after Teledad format in 2000, nine I think most people would have agreed completely. At that time, it was pretty insane that Goyo Guardian was a level 6 synchro with stats that were better than most level 8s. It also had an incredibly easy to trigger effect that let him snatch still opponent's monsters. But two years later, Goyo was just another great synchro monster. It wasn't the best synchro in the game, it was no longer meta breaking, the timing of this just didn't make a lot of sense. 2012. In March, Glow Up Bulb, Spore, and Trishula, Dragon of the Ice Barrier. Then in September, Brionic, Dragon of the Ice Barrier, was banned. We have finally gotten to the infamous March 2012 ban list. I did an entire video on this, by the way. This ban list wasn't just infamous because of the monsters that it banned, but also what it omitted. Clan Synchro had a huge competitive run, and every Ice Barrier Synchro monster is seemingly broken. However, this list definitely should have added Wind Up Hunter. I digress. The Ice Barrier Synchros were both powerhouses, and Brionic enabled Infernity to loop Trishula infinitely to eliminate your opponent's entire opening hand, or just deck them out if they chose to use Max C. In my opinion, Brionic actually should have been banned the year prior, as I think with maybe the exception of Dark Strike Fighter, it was arguably the best Synchro in the game for every format it was legal in. The card was very easy to summon, served as monster spell and trap removal, and also helped manipulate the graveyard, which was important for dropping things like Dark Arm Dragon. Spore and Glow Up Bulb were banned for the same exact reason, self-reviving tuners that did so while expending no resources whatsoever. Even if you didn't commit them to a synchro summon, both cards could be useful fodder for things like enemy controller, Kaya summons, or just kind of like whatever. They were both also easily summonable from the deck with Lone Fire Blossom, so you didn't actually have to draw the cards either. I will say there was an argument to be made that with plants being absolutely murdered and infinite loops gone, Trishula probably didn't need to be banned. I think it was kind of 50-50 with the players, but Konami mainly did this, at least I believe, to push duelists to play xe based strategies and get them off of synchros. 2013. In March, Sangan and Wind Up Carriers and Mighty. Then in September, Elemental Hill Stratos, Number 16 Shockmaster, and all four Baby Dragon Rulers, Stream, Burner, Reactant, and Lightning. Sangan didn't deserve the ban in 2004, but a decade later, it definitely did. It was mainly Tour Guide's fault, as now everyone was summoning Sangan from the deck, and if you tried to punish them with Torrential Tribute or Mirror Force, the Sangan would just float into something just as good, like Maxi, Effect Failure, or Rescue Rabbits. Zemighty was a ridiculous card, and in hindsight was way ahead of its time. 
Carrier could easily be summoned just off a tour guide and summoned a wind up monster from your deck with no restrictions. When combined with wind up rat specifically, it allows you to summon three copies of itself for the price of one. This is how the wind up loop works, although you could transition into other XC monsters like Shockmaster. Speaking of which, Shockmaster is one of those cards Konami thought would be too difficult for any good deck to summon, so they gave it an effect that could lock down your opponent for an entire turn. Turns out with Zemighty, it wasn't hard to summon at all. Taking away monsters, spells, or traps entirely from certain decks just wasn't fair, so they had to get rid of the card. E Hero Stratos getting banned was random but understandable. About half a dozen meta hero decks had been anchored by this card for six years, and honestly, he hadn't lost any power. I think it was random because heroes weren't a top three deck at that point, but they were still a strong contender. I think Konami finally just got sick of seeing the card, so they just decided to give it the axe. When it comes to the baby dragon rulers, something had to give. The archetype is one of the most powerful in Yu-Gi-Oh history, and the only way to beat it was just to stop them from summoning completely with cards like Ophion or Jalgen. If you didn't do that, you were most definitely going to lose. The babies allowed the big rulers to be summoned straight from the deck, and the big rulers themselves were beyond broken. Konami banned the babies first so that they wouldn't have to go after the big ones. 2014, in April, Morphing Jar and Morphing Jar number two were banned. TCG and OCG had completely different ban lists at this point, and this felt like one of those we've been waiting to get rid of you for a while type of moves. Flip effects definitely weren't the meta or really even being played during this time. In terms of reasoning, Morphine Jar number two is almost identical to Cyber Jar. It's incredibly random and I personally believe just super unfun in general. If I wanted to make an argument for the original Morphine Jar, I'd argue that drawing five cards in this game should never be part of any Yu-Gi-Oh effect. It's also a recovery card that kind of rewards bad play. I think these cards were both ban worthy, but I feel like these should have been banned in GX, maybe around 2006. 2015, in April, the Dragon Rulers, this time the Big Dragon Rulers, Tempest, Blaster, Redox, and Tidal. In July, Gen Releaser Rituals and Laval Val Chain. And then finally, in November, Apocalyphort Towers, El Shadal Construct, Evil Swarm, Exciton Knight, and Shurit, Strategist of the Necros were all banned. As I mentioned earlier, the power of the Dragon Rulers as an archetype was utterly ridiculous. Giant monsters that all special summoned themselves from the hand or graveyard that searched other cards when banished and had utility effects. By this point, Konami had experimented with basically everything, hitting the babies, limiting the rulers. You could say that this was the only option left. The Dark Matter Dragon Ruler deck had just arrived and was going to be a nightmare. They could have easily banned these guys in like 2013, so we did get a good run with them. General Releaser of Rituals was utterly meta-defining. With the release of the Necros archetype, there was finally a deck that could abuse this card. Jen allowed a one-sided roll of oppression that could be used against the opponent for the Necros player, basically ensuring that the opponent couldn't win if they didn't kill the Necros ritual monster first, which because of their protective hand effects, was incredibly difficult. Jin was probably the most hated card of the entire year. Lavaval Chain was the card that Necros players used to set up the Jin lock, so a lot of the community didn't like that, and it was arguably problematic in prior years within decks like Infernity. In a vacuum, I don't think the card was ban-worthy, but I'll be honest, it did have a tendency to mainly be used in what a lot of people saw as degenerative combos. Towers, Construct, and Shurit were all banned so Konami could usher out the Duelist Alliance meta. Individually, Towers and Shurit were ban-worthy. I'm not so certain about Construct. Towers created the concept of the unkillable and unaffected by everything monster. I don't believe that that should have ever been a thing. Boss monsters didn't need that much protection. It also debuffed opponent's monsters as well. Necroz Shurit allowed the archetype to summon any ritual for a one monster payment and then float it anyways when it was used. Necroz already had ways of cheating ritual summoning with real resources, so I feel like they didn't need this type of uh, floating as well. Construct was still a very strong card, but the days of it dominating the metagame were just long gone at this point, so this was a Goyo Guardian type ban. Lastly, Evil Swarm Excites on Knight was the easiest 6C rank in the entire game to make, and most decks could summon it no problem. This card actually rewarded you for being in a losing position, and Yu-Gi-Oh players hate that almost more than anything. 2016, in April, Performance Damage Juggler, Performance Plush Fire, and Teller Knight Tolemias. And in August, perform a Power Monkey Board. 
All four of these bands basically came because of one deck, Performages and Pals, aka Pepe. Monkey Board was an easily searchable one card full pendulum scale with no cost, so the card was just too strong. Damage Juggler was a hand trap that could negate meta cards like Wavering Eyes, stop battle damage, and floated from the graveyard into another monster without waiting a turn. The utility of this card was just absolutely off the charts. Performage Plush Fire was its partner in crime. When destroyed, Plush Fire summoned another Performage monster straight from your deck. Usually this was Damage Juggler. That monster not only served as its seed fodder, but if it was Damage Juggler specifically, then it would float from the graveyard and you would get yourself another monster. Popping your scales in those days with the likes of Performa Pal Pendulum Sorcerer, Luster Pendulum, and Wavering Eyes was quite beneficial as those cards could all replace your pop scale with another monster, and then you'd just be able to summon more monsters with Plush Fire. Since Plush Fire wasn't a once per turn effect, this usually led to an avalanche of summon and advantage. Telonite Telemias is the only card on this list that I personally don't feel needed to be banned in the TCG because all the card ever really did for us was cheat out Cyber Dragon Infinity. Sure, it was strong, but I don't feel like it was banned worthy. In the OCG, they had Azathoth and Telemias out at the same time, which was a completely different story as that led to OTKs even through hand traps, but that was never an issue in the TCG. The card pools were just different. 2017, in March, Magispect the Unicorn Karen and the Tyrant Neptune. Then, in June, Elder Entity Norden. In September, Digustal Emerald, then Long First of the Yang Zing. Dynamite Knight, the True Draco Fighter. Grand Soul, the Elemental Lord. True King, Lithogasm, the Disaster. And then, Zodiac Broadbull and Zodiac Dryden's. So we're starting to get into Vrains, and as you can see, this is when Konami went banless crazy. Kirin was a non-targetable, free disruption bounce for every single Pendulum deck in the game, and it was just too easy to summon for how good it was. Norden allowed every deck to cheat and spam out rank fours like nobody's business by the way of instant fusion. Digustal Emerald, Grand Soil, and Lithogasm were all banned for janky FTKs, although Lithogasm was also pretty crazy when you combined it with dinosaurs that actually ended up winning worlds that year. Dynamite Knight was so stupidly random, Konami really tried dancing around banning Masterpiece for a while, and this card unfortunately got scapegoated. The Tyrant Neptune also got scapegoated. It was part of a pseudo FTK, one in which your opponent would basically get one full turn to play before you burn them to death. The real problem was actually Liralu's Independent Nightingale, not the Tyrant Neptune because that card facilitated the entire thing. Dinlong is actually kind of ironic. I would argue that the card is too powerful for being a generic level 5 synchro as it added a card on summon, had a foolish burial effect, and then floated upon leaving the field. However, its archetype Yang Zing is not what got the card banned. It actually had more so to do with dinosaurs and how easily that deck could summon it. The Zodiac Xyz totally deserved the bans they got. Konami reworked the entire XC mechanic for this archetype alone, and they became almost tier zero instantly because of it. Broadbull gave the deck a monster for free every single turn, and Dryden was a free disruptor. 2018, in February, Blackwing Gofu, The Vague Shadow, Dandelion, Level Eater, Maxi, Performa Pal Scroll Kabat Joker, and Double Iris Magician. Later in May, Astrograph Sorcerer, Masterpiece to True Draco Slaying, King, Phoenixon Cluster Amaryllis, Supreme King and Dragon Starving Venom, and Ancient Fairy Dragon. A little bit after that in September, Nightmare Goblin, MX Saber Invoker, and Samsara Lotus. Finally in December, Firewall Dragon. 2018 was another huge year for banned monsters. It's also when Konami started its crusade to hit anything good that produced tokens because tokens were broken when used for link summoning. This meant cards like Dandelion and Gofu were too strong for their own good. Gofu especially because it was a one card link three. Dandelion on the other hand wasn't once per turn, didn't have to be summoned to be useful, and was easily loopable. I actually argued for Level Eater to be banned even before links were a thing and got trash for that take. As in my opinion, it had basically become a better and more generic version of Fishboard Blaster. However, Lynx just made Level Eater the best monster fodder card in the entire game for climbing, whether you were linking or synchro summoning. Joker was the new age Stratos, so that got him banned. A meta card that searched three completely different archetypes. Double Iris and Astrograph were constantly looped in conjunction with Joker for easy pluses in pendulum decks. Destroying your own scales had become the it thing to do again, and this triggered the cards constantly. 
Maxi's banning was highly controversial and still remains so to this day. It's clearly the most powerful hand trap of all time, but many in the community, including myself, see it as a necessary evil. This ban, I believe, is simply a difference of ideologies between the OCG and TCG versions of Konami R&D. Masterpiece was finally banned, as it was in most instances a better version of Cleefort Towers, usually just as hard to kill, easier to summon, and offered better disruption during the opponent's turn. Phoenixen Cluster, Amaryllis, and Samsora Lotus were both banned for janky FTKs. Supreme King Dragon Starving Venom was banned for a good FTK. I would like to point out, just like with the Tower Neptune one, this FTK could have been made completely impossible if Konami had simply banned Lyra Luce and Dependent Nightingale. So I'm gonna say that this card was scapegoated. Nightmare Goblin lets you normal summon twice, which was a horrible idea from the beginning from Konami. MX Saber Invoker was very similar to Rescue Cat. It had now defined the metagame in two different years with two completely different meta decks. That's a surefire way to get yourself banned as it lets you summon Goki and Zodiac monsters straight from the deck. I think Ancient Fairy Dragon was banned because the power of field spells had kind of gotten out of control. This thing searched them and granted you a special summon from the hand. Honestly, it was Konami's fault for adding so much power creep to the field spells themselves. Firewall Dragon is another instance of a card that should have never been created. It arguably ruined the entire 2018 year of Yu-Gi-Oh! single-handedly as it enabled FTKs, extra links, and was good disruption, not to mention it was a pretty generic link monster. 2019, in January, Fairy Tail Snow, Grinder Golem, number 42, Galaxy Tomahawk, number 86, Heroic Challenger Rango Myriad, and Topologic Gumblar Dragon. In April, number 95, Galaxy Eyes Dark Matter Dragon and Summon Sorceress. Later in July, Equips Wyvern and the Phantom Knights of Rusty Bardiche. Finally, in October, Guard Dragon Argapane and Nightmare Mermaid. So this was the year Konami started going ham on Link Monsters. Grinder Golem and Galaxy Tomahawk were both part of the Token Killing Crusade. If you printed out tokens in mass, there was a good chance that you would lead the link spamming and thus you got banned. Fairy Tale Snow was pretty interesting to me. It was a super good card, although I don't know that it needed to be banned. They probably could have tried it at limited status first. Snow was usually dumped into the graveyard by Brilliant Fusion, and then Snow would banish cards from the grave to summon herself for free. She was excellent link fodder, had disruption, and specifically in the Thunder Dragon deck, could trigger them while summoning herself. I think the Thunder Dragon element probably got her banned, although I'll admit not being a once per turn or even a once per chain for that matter was actually kind of problematic. Rungo Myriad was kind of like a cross between Apocalyphort Towers and Gen Releaser Rituals. It was unaffected by any card effects your opponent tried using, stopped them from summoning entirely, and could also nuke your opponent's board. Just like Shockmaster, Konami made the 6C monster entirely too powerful, thinking that it would be near impossible to summon. Unlike Shockmaster, however, people built in entire deck solely to summon this one card. Rango was absolutely the epitome of your opponent cannot play the game. Guard Dragon Argopane lets you cheat out powerful negation synchro monsters like Crystal Wing and Hot Red Dragon Archfiend Abyss for almost no effort. Whether it be Magical Scientist, Cyberstein, or the Zodiac Archetype, Konami has a history of banning these extra deck cheaters. Topologic Gumblar Dragon was banned because it allowed players to discard two to four cards from their opponent's hand. The fact that it could be used during either player's turn really put it over the top in terms of power. Multiple meta decks like Goki and Thunder Dragon were playing Gumblar, and cards that discard multiple cards from the opponent's hand almost always get banned in this game. See the Link one duo. Dark Matter Dragon and Eclipse Wyvern both relate to Thunder Dragons, but honestly, they were both probably going to get banned eventually anyways, especially Dark Matter Dragon, as that card was just another ticking time bomb. Dragons are the most supported type in Yu-Gi-Oh! history, and Konami always has them in mind. Dark Matter honestly was always a broken card in my opinion, but you can make an argument that without the Dragon Rulers there was nothing to exploit it with. However, the Guard Dragons were essentially the New Age Dragon Rulers in terms of power, and Dark Matter became broken again. Dumping three monsters from your deck to the graveyard as a cost, multiple attacks on monsters, and being able to be cheated out by summoning a rank 8 and slapping this guy on top, the card was pretty absurd, honestly. Eclipse Wyvern was fairly shocking when it happened, but it was inevitable. Wyvern got caught up in all this dragon madness. It was always a prime target for Dark Matter Dragon, but now it could be summoned straight from the deck with Guard Dragon LP and triggered multiple times in a single turn. This usually led to Red Eyes Darkness Metal Dragon being 
being looped for some incredibly crazy boards. Nightmare Mermaid and Rusty Bardiche were both banned because of Orcus. Bard alone was a crazy card. The fact that it couldn't be used as Link material and still got banned is a testament to how powerful it was. Its effect generated tons of advantage and free defensive cards. It also could disrupt your opponent during their turn. Nightmare Mermaid allowed any two monsters in the game to basically become the full Orcus combo. Orcus was already strong as a standalone deck at this point. Mermaid just allowed any deck to basically splash in Orcus, which was super annoying. Summon Sorceress was banned because she was seen as the best Link climbing monster in the game. Game. Basically the definitive Link 3 when you wanted to keep laddering up and going for more Link monsters. Also, Konami probably made too many Link monsters that special summon from the deck and she was one of those cards. 2020, in January, if the World Chalice Justicky R, Orcus Harpoor, Alter Entity Azathoth, Salaman Great Mirage Dalio, Tempest Magician, Thunder Dragon Colossus, and Heavy Metaphors Electromite, in April, Blackwing Steam the Cloak, Glow Up Bulb, Destrudo, The Lost Dragon's Frieson, Luna Light Tiger, and Spiral Master Plane, then in September, Block Dragon, Jet Sync Run, Mecha Phantom Beast O Lion, finally in December, Dragon Buster Destruction Sword, and Link Cross. Just like Konami did in 2015, a lot of the early bands this year were definitely to end an era of competitive Yu-Gi-Oh! and usher in a new one. In my opinion, the Salaman Great Mirage Dalio and Thunder Dragon Colossus bands were both silly and completely unwarranted. Sure, Mirage Dalio was designed to be a clone of a banned card, but this one locked its deck into one attribute for an entire turn. Without Colossus, Thunder Dragons barely had any good ways of slowing down the opponent, and it felt like the deck kind of lost its win condition. Orcus Harpoor was debatable, and most said at the time that it was a fine band, but it really wasn't very definitive from the Yu-Gi-Oh! community. Tempest Magician was an FTK card that was long overdue for a ban. It was straight up bad card design in my opinion. She was literally a remake of Denlong, a card that Konami had already banned in the TCG, except she was more powerful and more generic. Heavy Metaphors Electromite was ban worthy, however, in this instance, the timing was fairly weird. The card probably should have gone the year prior. Despite not being a dominant meta card at this point, Jerome McHale from TCG Konami R&D specifically banned her because he felt like her existence made every Pendulum deck play exactly the same which is true. With or without Ptolemaeus, Azathoth was broken. It could be summoned during your opponent's turn to completely lock them out of monster effects, or during your turn to lock them out of hand traps that would stop your plays. Azathoth was a condition and did not activate, which made it near impossible to stop. Luna Light Tiger was one of the best ways to abuse Azathoth. Tiger was always a card that had enormous potential because it was not a hard once per turn effect, but post the release of Luna Light Yellow Martin, you were able to use its reborn effect something like four to five times per turn, per copy of the card. Even as a fan of Luna Lights, no deck needs that many monster reborns. Spiral Master Plan was another non once per turn card from Arc V that was being heavily exploited. Konami tried limiting three cards in Spiral, but the deck was still meta. Master Plan was basically the Luna Light Tiger for Spiral in terms of how they would use one card to constantly generate advantage. Block Dragon was another one of those ticking time bomb cards like Rescue Cat and Lone Fire Blossom, which, side note, never actually ended up getting banned. Block Dragon always had a ceiling that reached the heavens, and all it was going to take was Konami making one good rock archetype. The second that happened with Adam Emancipators, Block Dragon became the single best monster in the entire game. He was basically a dragon ruler when that happened, probably even better. Destrudo came out of left field and felt very similar to Fairy Tail Snow. Really, really strong card and one that helped decks go into Guard Dragon plays very easily, but somewhat high risk as it cost half your life points. I think it probably didn't need to be banned, especially considering that it wasn't very prominent with the synchro summoning plays that it had once become very known for when it was used for Ancient Fairy Dragon combos. Mecha Phantom Beast O Lion, Jet Synchron, and Steam the Cloak were all banned because Konami hates tuners. That's a joke. These cards were all being exploited with Christron Halifibrax, which itself is actually the problem. Konami doesn't want to ban that card yet because it's too new, so they're banning all the older tuners. Honestly, I don't think any of these cards are banworthy. Actually, hold that thought. I take that back. Steam the Cloak is actually kind of crazy. That card is probably banworthy. Link Cross was probably the worst card designed since Firewall Dragon. Its creation made absolutely no sense at all. We know cards that produce multiple tokens are broken with Link Monsters. Why they would make a Link Monster that you could summon for free, and one that also gave you multiple tokens is just beyond my comprehension. Dragon Buster Destruction Swordsman was basically the new age Genlock. 
It was used in conjunction with Union Carrier to be equipped from your deck on any dragon or dark monsters. This could lock out your opponent from the extra deck. If your opponent needed the extra deck to play or to do any of their core combos, well, then they just automatically lost the duel. 2021 in March, VFD, True King of All Calamities, Number S0, Yatop Exexel, and Union Carrier were all banned. Then in July, Zodiac Dridents and Gar Dragon LB. True King of All Calamities finally got what it had coming to it. Much like other XC lockdown monsters such as Shockmaster, Azathoth, and Rango Myriad, VFD could pretty much lock your opponent out of one major card type for an entire turn. In addition to taking away your opponent's monster effects, VFD also stops your opponent's monsters from attacking entirely, thus making it that much harder to kill. It had been a dominant card in years prior with the True King Dinosaur deck, but that was mostly mitigated with the banning of Lithogasm. However, with the release of the Virtual World Archive, type, a deck that specialized in making level 9 synchros, you had a theme that could often go into multiple VFDs in its first turn. Calamities was completely meta warping and was one of those you better answer it immediately or you're gonna lose next turn cards. Your topic as zero was almost identical to VFD. A few years prior, it had popped up in the competitive meta, but the issue was addressed by banning another card, which largely solved the problem for years. Zexel always had auto win potential because it could stop your opponent from activating all cards during their turn, and that effect could be used three times. The thing is, much like VFD, it wasn't exactly the easiest monster to summon until new support completely changed that. When Konami released Don Thousand's Numeron cards in summer 2020, Numeron Network gave any deck the ability to summon S0 and lock down the opponent for a single card. While the Numeron engine did have some glaring flaws, when it went off, it almost always ensured victory. To make matters even worse, Konami also created a huge wave of Utopia support in Lightning Overdrive that would have increased Sexel's potential tremendously even beyond the Numeron engine itself. Konami banned Zexel not just on its own merit, but they also knew that a catastrophe was imminent if they didn't. The Union Carrier ban was pretty shocking because it fell under that still a new card category, but unfortunately this was another example of a card that was basically going to be good forever. Much like Lavalval Chain, Union Carrier was incredibly easy to summon and seemingly always found itself in the middle of unfun and unfair combos. Whether it was equipping Block Dragon from the deck for Ad Emancipators, Destruction Sword for Dragon Link, or various cards in Tritron, it became very clear to the Yu-Gi-Oh community and to Konami that there would always be a new card or combo to be discovered and exploited with each new format. The simple truth of the matter was, the longer that Union Carrier existed in the game, the more problems the card was inevitably going to cause, so Konami ultimately recognized that and axed it. Guard Dragon LP was a card that Duelist literally complained about for years. Right out of Savage Strike, it made an immediate impact in a competitive meta and was generally seen as one of the best extenders in the entire game. There's never been a shortage of good dragon cards in Yu-Gi-Oh! and LP helped to exploit that to the highest degree. LP was a Link 1, thus making it insanely easy to make, and summon basically any dragon monster straight from your deck. While the Guard Dragon theme was supposed to be a boost specifically for the dragon type, what Konami didn't realize when designing them was how splashable dragons were, and in turn, the guard dragons would become. LP saw play in Dragon Link, Pendulums, Thunder Dragons, and gave all those decks a failsafe play to fall back on if things didn't go well, and a gigantic extender if they did. Zodiac Dryden was a real head scratcher, and many wondered if the OCG's July ban list, which also put her on ice, had heavenly influenced stars. Don't get me wrong, Dryden was definitely in the competitive meta mix, seeing high level play in Eldritch Zodiac, Tri Brigade Zodiac, and of course Pure Zoo. However, there were essentially no complaints about the card coming from the community. I think one of the clear differences between Dryden in 2021 and Dryden in 2017 was her being at limited status this time around. Unless you were playing pure Zodiac, one Dryden was almost all a duelist was going to get in a single game, and her destruction effect, while high utility, never felt overwhelming or too powerful in that meta. In fact, Dryden's importance to her own archetype had actually been surpassed by cards like Zodiac Borbo and Divine Arsenal Double A Zeus, the latter of which was basically Dryden on steroids. Most duelists actually laughed at this band as players thought aloud, was this really one of the biggest problems with the format? 2022, in February, Ava, Arch Nemesis Protoss, and Samorg, Bird of Sovereignty. I'll start with Ava because it was by far the most surprising of the three. 
Abel was played in Drytron as a searchable utility card that could be discarded by Herald of the Orange Light or by one of the Ritual Heralds. This served as not only a negation, but simultaneously, it would replace itself with its graveyard effect. Back on the previous October 2021 ban list when Abel was limited, many players claimed that the card should have simply been outright banned because it was searchable by Cyber Angel Ben 10 and you could dump it to the graveyard with Beatrice Lady of Eternal. Also, it was trending towards most players only running a single copy of Ava anyways. The thing is, however, by the time the February list rolled around, Tritron had fallen completely out of the top tier competitive meta, and people barely even mention the deck anymore in terms of hits on the ban list or the best decks to take to a high level tournament. This ban just felt strange, poorly timed, and honestly out of place. Arch Nemesis Protoss was a card I actually defended, but in vain. The power ceiling of Protoss was always insane and never in question as it held an ability that could stop your opponent from special summoning an entire attribute for their whole turn and did so as a lingering effect. Protoss also held an immunity towards destruction, so this meant at minimum you could always call Dart for free. What really got this monster in hot water was the incredibly competitive Sword Soul archetype being created. Overnight, it basically became highly searchable as well as very easy to summon because Sword Soul just happened to be a theme with many different attributes in the deck, and it could also just search worms at will. To me, this was kind of like wrong place, wrong time, but really, the second that any competitive theme could search a card like Protoss, it was just going to spell trouble. Last but certainly not least, Samor Bird of Sovereignty. This card was crazy, and maybe the only Link monster I can think of that swayed the game more and more in its owner's favor the longer it stayed on the board. This is because Samoric summons monsters at every single end phase. The effect is supposed to be limited by allowing a player to only summon a monster whose level is equal to or lower than the number of unused spell and trap zones. But Liralus got a whole bunch of support and basically became very good very, very quickly. A bunch of the Liralus monsters are also plus ones on summon, and they all just happen to be level one monsters as well. So the balancing factor for Samorg just went completely out of the window. And this turned the card effectively into just like a serious advantage producing machine. It also gave all monsters, well, wing beast monsters that it pointed to, free protection from targeting because why not? Samor was supposed to be a difficult boss monster that allowed its archetype the ability to summon maybe one of its big birds from the deck for free, but players just soon realized that if you combine Tri Brigade with Liralus, you could get way more out of this card than Konami ever imagined. I think you could say that Samorg is just another one of those Link monsters, very similarly to something like Christron, Hall of Firebrax, or Isolde, that get way more used outside of its archetype. And there you have it, over 15 years of bandless history in a single video. It took a long time to put this one together, and hopefully it was worth it. If you enjoyed the video, or more importantly, you learned something, give the video a thumbs up, and thank you for watching as always.